I'd like to welcome Claire Swale. She is from Lancashire in the UK. Claire currently owns 80 registered Holsteins under her own prefix, Heavenly, the majority of which are housed in the UK. After leaving school and fitting cattle for a period of time, she studied dairy herd management and went on to rejuvenate and relaunch a successful platform for selling cattle in the UK, hosting regular monthly sales of up to 200 head each month through Lancaster Dairy Sales. She is extremely well-traveled, documenting shows all over the world to global audience. These opportunities to travel and visit some of the world's top breeders also allowed her to write and illustrate their stories over a number of years for Cowsmopolitan uh, magazine. Today, Claire buys and sells cattle and owns, an, owns and operates a success, successful expert, export company, specializing in supplying and delivering dairy cattle for the export market, as well as continuing to provide online coverage of the show. Throughout her 25 year judging career, she has had the opportunity to judge confirmation and showmanship all, uh, all over the UK and in multiple foreign countries, including Australia, Belgium, Canada, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, New Zealand, and Switzerland. In 2019, she became the first person from outside North America to judge the highly acclaimed 4-H classic showmanship competition at the Royal Winter Fair in Canada. She considers herself extremely fortunate to have a career in the industry she loves, working with great cows and great people. Passionate about the youth of our ind industry, she has always been a great supporter of such industries on both sides of the Atlantic. Claire is going to be talking to us about judging, including ring etiquette, presentation, evaluating a class, and delivering concise and accurate reasons. Please help me welcome Claire Swale. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. Perfectly. Okay, well, um, first of all, I'm really happy to be here to you, talking to you all tonight. It's a great privilege for me. Um, like you said in my bio, I'm really passionate about the youth. It's how I got started. It's how I grew my love and enthusiasm for the industry. So if I can help do the same for all of you guys, then, then I'm going to enjoy that because being involved in 4-H or in the youth organizations, whatever country you live in, um, it allows you to meet new people, enjoy fun times and have new experiences and learn lots of things. Um, secondly, I'm not scary. A lot of you will already know me and have seen me at the shows. Maybe you've um, competed it when I judged at the 4-H show. If you've got any questions, please feel free to like interrupt and, and ask them. I'm not going to bite. There's no such thing as a stupid question, honestly. So whatever you want to ask, I'll try and answer it. Um, I've made a presentation this evening, so a slideshow. Um, like you heard in the, in the introduction, I've traveled a lot of countries and I take a lot of photographs. So finding photographs to do this PowerPoint presentation wasn't really a problem. Um, so we'll get straight on onto it. And like I say, if you've got any questions at all, then please feel free to just shout or put your hand up or do whatever you want. Just bear with me one moment. This is all really new to me. Okay, can you all still hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background. You've probably heard it all in the, in the bio anyway, which um, basically perfectly sort of describe what I do. There's a few pictures which sort of illustrate what I do. Down in the bottom is my son, Harvey. He's 19 years old and he's probably my most important role in life as his, father, as, as his mother even. <laughs> Um, then you've got a picture um, at the 4-H show with Madison winning champion showman. Um, I'm also no stranger to showing cats on myself, so um, you've got that. And then the other picture is taking pictures in Quebec. Um, but I've been judging for 25 years. 
and I've judged all over the world. And I love the industry that I'm in. I couldn't, I've always wanted to do it. I always knew that I'd do it. And I'm very lucky that I've made my way doing it. Um, again, you've all heard this in the bio, but it just shows you a few pictures that I've taken at some of the shows. Um, the bottom left, one thing, one thing you're perhaps not aware of is the shows in Europe. Everybody gets a little crazy. That's the best way of describing it. Um, the European breeders are really, really passionate. Um, when a class is judged, they're all really clapping their hands and they're really expressive in what they do. It's, it's like, don't get me wrong, Madison and the Winter Fair are by far the best standard of shows in the world. But some of the shows in Europe, the atmosphere is just absolutely amazing. Um, sorry, you can see this, this photo down, why is it doing that? This photo in the bottom corner is, um, is of a young gentleman winning junior champion at a show in Switzerland. As you can see, he was pretty stoked about it. This middle photo is a show in Germany. Um, his kids came running into the ring and everybody was crying. And then the Brown Swiss show was actually in Italy this year. And then if you look above, there's a couple of Cosmopolitan covers photos that I took. The cow on the right um, is a famous Swiss cow who I won't say what her name is. And then the other cow is another Swiss cow. What both of these cows have in common is they were pictured as junior cows. She was pictured as a two-year-old. The other one was pictured as a three-year-old. And they both went on to win the European Holstein shows, which is quite a cool fact. Um, like, you, like you heard, I'm, I do export and uh, export sales. So I export cattle mainly to Dubai, Holsteins and Jerseys and some Wagyu's. So what this involves is uh, going around farms and selecting the cattle and then organizing all the export for them to go over to Dubai. Um, this is actually a pretty interesting photo because they went to the king of Dubai and this is actually his own plane which he just sent over for the cattle. So that doesn't happen every day but it's kind of a, a nice story to sort of tell. Um, on the left is Heavenly Golden Dreams. He's a full brother to Atwood and that was a bull that I bought as an embryo. Um, well, actually, I was working for a company at the time and was waiting on commission. So I took three embryos instead and, and they were grade B embryos and that's how Golden Dreams was born. So sometimes things do work out. Um, I now work for Blonde in Sires also and I'm the UK sales manager. So we're just starting to market the Blonde in Bulls in the UK. So that's basically how I um, occupy my time. Okay, so you may have heard or seen that throughout this presentation this evening, um, there's a small competition. It's not a big competition. It's not a serious competition. It's just a chance for you to win yourself a clipping jacket and a beanie hat. Um, it just makes the presentation a little bit more interesting and it gives you the chance to show off your knowledge if you know the cows. So throughout the presentation, there will be pictures of six cows, which will have one of these flash marks on them, numbered one to six. All you have to do to be in with a chance of winning the, the jacket and the hat is just simply say number one is and the name of the cow. And that's all you have to do. I just want the complete name of the cow um, for every cow. And then at the end of it, as long as you email me your entries, by Monday the 15th of June, include your name, your age, and your complete mailing dress so as I can send you the jacket because it, right now with COVID, it doesn't really look as if I'll be getting to Canada anytime soon. Um, and just put what size you want. And then I will send it over to whoever, if there's only one person who gets it right, they'll win the jacket and the hat. If there's more, more than one person, I'll just draw a random entry and that's how it will work. Everybody clear with that? Any questions on it? No? Okay, that's good. Okay, so my presentation this evening is all about judging. You're, you are going to be the judge and I'm going to try and help you with judging and give you a guide to giving good reasons. Okay, now I like everybody to get involved when I do stuff. So throughout the presentation, I may ask you questions and I'm kind of stubborn as everybody will tell you. So if I don't get at least one answer, 
then I'm not moving on to the next slide. So it could be a really long night and I have calves to feed in the morning. So, so please participate. There's, like I say, there's, no, there's going to be no correct or wrong answers, but it's just nice if you get involved with it. So can any of you think of occasions when being able to judge cows will or could benefit you? Somebody's going to have to speak up. If not, I'm going to pick on Brianne because she's smiling. <laughs> okay, so can anybody think of a reason why judging cows is going to help you in the future or now? It could help you by knowing what to look for in a cow when purchasing. Perfect. Absolutely brilliant. Anybody else got a reason? Okay, we've had so, one. Oh, go so on. We, do, we have a few people with hands raised. So, okay, go uh, ahead. Courtney, go ahead. Sarah stole mine. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. And who else has their hand raised? Shall I move on? Uh, oh, we have a whole bunch of people. How about Jocelyn? Okay. Um, when you're trying to breed a cow and you're trying to decide uh, who to breed it to. So corrective mating, that's a great reason. Anybody else? And Ashlyn and Seamus had an answer. Um, okay. Just like being able to identify like how like well, like if it's a cow, how well like the other attachment, like the rear attachment is all, like, yeah. Yep, really good reasons. Anybody else or shall I move on and talk about it a little bit more? I think we've got one more from Elizabeth. Okay, Elizabeth. Or Peyton has her hand up and also Stella has her hand up. Okay, Peyton. When being able to judge, it'll help you try to be a better judge in the future. Yep, that's good to improve. And that's and when you're giving reasons, the only way you are going to improve is if you practice, practice, practice. So that's a really good reason. Then go ahead, Stella. Learning to speak in front of others. Really good. Well done. That's a good reason. Okay, so. It's good to be able to judge for a number of reasons. Um, like I mentioned, it's great to compete in competitions and 4-H is great for that. It builds confidence, it lets you compete against other members, um, and it lets you meet loads and loads of people. So, so competing in competitions is a really great reason why it's good to learn to be able to judge. Um, then we've got a picture below of four cows from Switzerland. This was actually in the run up to the European show. But what it tells you is um, if you can judge cows, you can maybe perhaps choose your show calf for the, four, for the year for 4-H, or you can help choose which animals you're gonna to take to a show. And then I think somebody mentioned it, deciding what animals to invest in. When you've got a big lineup of calves and you've got money to spend, or perhaps you're looking to buy a 4-H calf or your parents are going to buy something, You've got to be able to go down that row of cattle and evaluate them and decide what you're looking for in an animal and which is going to be the best purchase for you. So being able to judge and evaluate those sale cattle um, is going to be really, really important. And then also somebody else said about corrective mating. This is actually at my brother's herd um, here in England. But if you can walk through your cows and say, Say your favorite cow's bullying um, that day and she needs served. Corrective mating is kind of, a, is kind of an art which has kind of been lo lost a little bit, maybe you could argue with the introduction of genomics. Um, like corrective mating is when you look at a cow, you look at where her faults and her strengths are, and you look at a bull's proof or the genomic proof and you try and, you try and fix the mistakes and you try and make that cow better or how you want it to be. So it's really important to be able to judge so as perhaps you can make those informed decisions and breed cows correctly. Okay, I've got a little bit of an echo. Has anybody got any questions?
No? Okay, we're good. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Holstein Canada actually do a really good manual, which I'd urge if you've never seen it, just look it up because it's got loads of valuable information in. And I've actually taken a picture of the true type model here and, um, and it's all identified with the correct terminology of how you, how you identify the different parts of the cow. Um, so basically, before you begin to assess a class or give reasons on a class, it's essential that you know the correct terminology and the parts of the body of the cow. So, so this diagram basically explains and points to every point of the cow. Um, there's some which you'll use more often than others in reason givings, but it's really important to know the main points of the cow, like where the pins are or where the, where the hips are or look at the legs and you, you see where the hock is when you're talking about the pastons or when we're talking about the udder, you want to know where the rear udder attachment and what the rear udder attachment should look like and, and also the fore udder attachment. And it's being able to identify the parts of the cow correctly. So as when you place your class, you can actually give reasons to identify the parts correctly to either the judge who's listening to you or the audience who's watching you. Okay, so has anybody ever heard of the true type model before? I'm presuming you probably have. Okay, so the true type model um, basically is a cow which a board or a committee of members have got together and they've crafted this cow together, putting together the ideal parts of a body cow, uh, the ideal parts of a cow to make what we call the true type model. And if you're watching a show, sometimes you'll hear a judge refer to an animal being most like the true type model, because that's supposedly what we're striving to breed. So in Canada, the classification program, we use a basic Holstein cow scorecard. Um, now, you can see on this diagram that, that it's marked in four different colours with the four main areas of the cow and what weighting they carry for classification. Now, it's good to know that classification is the evaluation of each animal individually compared to the true type model. So as you can see, the mammary system carries 42% of the weighting in the classification programme. Now, even though when you're judging a class of cows, you haven't got a scorecard to do when you're, when you're judging, or, or we don't have in the UK, you can kind of follow the same sort of weighting. So if you're judging a class of in milk cows, you know that the udder has got an extremely high weighting in the class, and it's gonna be really important to make sure that the cows with the best udders are near or at the top of the class. So judging and comparing animals in a class and sorting them in order of, judging is comparing animals in a class and sorting them in the order of merit. But where it gets really interesting is where you have to give reasons on them. We can use this diagram as a guide to reference the importance of each area of the cow. Has anybody got any questions on this and how we use it in judging? So Claire, one question that's come in in the chat box is what happens to the mammary system when it is a heifer? Okay, I've got some pictures to sort of demonstrate that. So we'll maybe, I'll come back to that when we see some different pictures, okay? Okay, so comparing individual parts. No two cows will ever be the same, but knowing where a cow's strengths and weaknesses are enable you to place a class and also know where to focus on in your reasons. Learning to give oral reasons can be one of the most challenging things to learn. Um, you can be nervous, shy, perhaps it's nerve wracking. Remember, everyone has to start somewhere and the only way you'll get more confident and more fluent giving reasons is to practice. So, so look at, you can look at four pictures of cows or six pictures of cows in a magazine and practice in your head of what reasons you give or, or place them in the order and say, you know, place them in the order from one to six. And, and maybe if you have to write reasons down for the first few times doing it, you will get better at doing it and there'll come a stage where you can do it just off memory. But 
practice, practice, practice. Like try giving reasons to your parents if they're if they're willing to listen to you. Give give reasons to them, or maybe video yourself on your phone and and listen to yourself back. Give reasons. But the only way that you will get better um, at giving reasons is either listening to official judges or reading up like the manuals that they do or by practicing giving reasons yourself. So, okay, this photo basically is the same five cows or the same cows majorly, but from different angles. Now, when you're judging cows, you've really got to study them from every angle because you'll see strengths and weaknesses of different cows in different areas. So, so when the animals come into the ring, view the animals from the center of the ring as they enter and watch them walk in. When you go and do an individual inspection of an animal, and it's the same with showmanship, you work efficiently around the animal, viewing them from the front. So you stand in front and you look at them and you're looking for the chest width, you're looking for style, you're looking for femininity. You move round to the right side and you're looking for strength of top line, you're looking from length to hook to pin and correct rump set. And then you move round and look at them from the other side and see if they've got this, any faults that side. And then you stand behind them and you study, the, you study the udder. So you're looking to see that width from behind, the width and height up through the rear udder. And then you watch them. Now, somebody mentioned in their questions in the roll call about tracking. I don't mind the word tracking because I always consider tracking to be the, the way they walk and their locomotion. But when you do stand behind them, the last thing you want to watch an animal do is move off away from you. And I describe that a little bit later on in some more pictures, but you'll see what I mean. But in this slide, I'm just trying to show the, the importance of looking at cows from every angle. So you can, like these, these same cows are featured in every photo, but you really do get a good um, illustration here of how when you stand in different places, you see different things about the cows and you can, you can visualize and assess the different parts of them by standing in different places. And it's exactly the same as showmanship. I know a lot of you will have competed in showmanship and you'll, you'll be aware that the judge moves around you and you switch the feet. And, and that's why the judge stands in different places in showmanship judging is to see how you react and, and how you move through that. But I know Steph did a great talk of showmanship, which you've probably all seen. So I, I'm not going to go into too much about showmanship judging unless somebody specifically asked me a question. So, okay. So finally, when cows are in a lineup, it's a great opportunity to compare them closely, especially through the mammary systems and also through the front ends. So, okay, whenever we're looking at cows we, and giving reasons, we want to look for the positives. Now you've got two cows here pictured at the Winter Fair in Canada in 2018, and they're both at very different stages of their life. One, the one on the right is a senior two-year-old and the one on the left is an aged cow. Now, a lot of you will know that a cow changes throughout her lifetime. You won't see the, strange, the same strength, width and capacity in a two-year-old as you would in an aged cow. But these diagrams basically show you some of the things that we're looking, through, looking for in cows. So, the cow on the left um, is also the first cow that you've got to name as well. So just look at the look at the, the red mark and she's numbered number one. So anybody who wants to compete in the competition, this is your first cow that I'm looking for the name for. So, but if you look at her, this cow has tremendous breed character. She's wide through the muzzle. She's extremely wide through the chest. You look at the way that her front legs are are squarely placed and they're coming straight down. So that's the correct front leg structure. And you can also see a little bit of her rib here. You can see her exceptional spring of rib. You can see that she's really deep in the body and capacious. Now, these are some of the traits that you'll see in an, in an older, more mature cow, especially in, in her capacity. The cow on the right is a, whoa, hang on a sec. 
the cow on the right is um is is like I said, she's a senior two year old, so you're not going to see the same the same width or the same capacity in a two year old as you would in an aged cow. Having said that, this uh, this two year old she's extremely feminine. She's got a strong jaw. She's got a really long dairy neck. She's clean throat and she's extremely dairy. Like I say, every animal should look appropriate for their age. Even the very best two-year-old won't have the same width, power, and capacity as an aged cow. Now, one of the other things I heard in the roll call, somebody said that they I think they said that they had an animal get put down because she looked too youthful. Um, I forget who it was, but that was one of the one of the points that got raised, and they said they didn't understand what it meant. Well, perhaps, and this is just an example, I may be wrong, but if you've got an aged cow class, this the aged cow you would expect to see a deeper, more capacious udder and more width and strength through the front end than maybe a milking yearling or a junior two-year-old. So perhaps that's what the judge meant. Maybe, maybe the udder on your animal was too shallow for the number of calves that she had. That's an example on, on what it could have been. Okay, we're always looking for the positives in animals, especially when we're giving reasons, but we also have to learn how to recognize the, neg the negatives and the things we, we don't want to look for in cows. So on the right here, um, we're looking at the chest width. We can see standing from behind that this animal is, is pretty narrow how she stood in the front. Even though she's got a really nice rear udder and it's full and high and wide of milk, when you look through between the, the back legs, you can see she's really stood narrow. And also this picture here, I don't know if you can see it circling with my arrow, but you can see she's narrow chest. When you compare it to the aged cow on the last slide, you can just see how the front legs are, are nearly touching and how there's very little width through here. So we would call those narrow chests. Um, and we can also look at this picture of these front feet, and this is actually on a cow too, but you can see she stood really narrow on them. She's got an incorrect front leg structure because she's what we call is towing out on her front feet. And obviously the feet could do with them a trim too. Now, um, on the right, we have a couple of pictures, which I'd, I'd really hope we wouldn't see in the show ring. But um, you can see on the cow at the top, she has what we call a wry face, which is like a con completely twisted, almost jaw and muzzle. And then the cow below, she's got excess jowl. She's a lot thicker and coarser through the neck and particularly through the skin, like right under her jaw, going down into her dewlap. Um, whilst we recognize the negatives in our head and you can, you can look at an animal and you can see that she's got faults, when you're giving reasons, you should really try and concentrate on the positives. Also remember that it's not impossible for an animal to give you a bad look. You can never look at an animal too much, but always be conscious of time. Um, like for example, this, this heifer stood in this picture here on the left. She, when I'm looking at her now, I'm thinking she's really narrow through the chest. But if the, if the show person was actually to put his foot on this front foot and widen her out, sorry, and was to widen her out, she would stand a lot wider in her chest. Now, it's not gonna completely hide the fact that she is narrow in the chest, but it would certainly help create the illusion that she's not as narrow in the chest. How am I doing? Please, if anybody's got any questions or wants to say anything, just maybe just put your hand up or let Jen know, or just, you know, rather than all the questions at the end, just if anybody's got anything that they want to raise, just feel free to butt in. Okay. Okay, this is a really lengthy slide, but it's a pretty important one when it comes to giving reasons. Okay, the whole point of giving reasons is to explain your placings. You've got to tell everybody why you've placed them in that order. Your role is to analyze each animal place them in order of merit and describe to spectators or the master judge if you're competing in a competition 
why you've placed them in that order. So when we're giving reasons or when we're judging a class for competitions, so stand behind the animals or stand and look at the animals and start to organize in your head your thoughts on how you're going to give reasons and which are the most important reasons. Start your reasons or your first class with a cordial statement indicating your pleasure to be invited to judge. It's a, it's a great way to sort of calm the nerves and to start off with something that you're confident doing. And it's also showing, you know, it's a great honor to go and judge somewhere, like show some appreciation. You've, you've got the opportunity to go and see cows. You've got the opportunity to go and meet people. You are delighted to be there. It's always a pleasure. So when you're giving reasons, speak slowly, clearly, and confidently. I've got a really bad habit, habit of what I think is motoring through. I, I really have to keep telling myself to slow down and speak clearly. And if any of you think I'm speaking or motoring through now, just say slow down because I know I like to talk and I can talk pretty quick. <laughs> So when you're giving your reasons, stand with confidence, try and look relaxed, even if you're absolutely bricking it inside. And um, when we start each set of reasons, so start them with an opening statement. Um, you, there's loads of opening statements you can use. I've just given you a few examples here, but um, maybe we've got a class of aged cows in front of us. Um, you could start, ladies and gentlemen, we have a great class of aged cows in front of us today or I'm leading off this aged cow class today with a cow that, or we have an easy winner in this aged cow class today, a cow that, or what a great pair of aged cows we have at the top of the class today. Those are all ways that you could start a class off before you actually start comparing the cows. It's an introduction to the class, it's a reminder to the spectators what class you're actually in, and it sets the tone for the whole of your reasons. So use simple words and the correct terminology that ringside spectators understand. Now for this, that's why that diagram of all the cow's parts of the anatomy is gonna be your best friend because it allows you to identify all the parts of the cows and use the correct terminology. So your, this is, what, this is what I was always taught when I was giving reasons. My mum and dad were always telling me to stop um and er and don't er and don't say it. But when you're giving reasons, ER words are going to be your best friend. Always use comparative terminology like longer, wider, higher, deeper, straighter, sharper. They're all words which are a comparison that can be used directly over the animal that you're placing below. So they're great words and adjectives to use when giving reasons. So when you're giving reasons, stick with the obvious differences which are applicable to that placing. Be accurate. The most obvious advantage followed by another couple of points um, about a cow is perfectly acceptable. Don't, don't make reasons up. Like you may have heard the best set of reasons and you think, okay, if I learn that set of reasons, I, that's how I'm going to give my reasons. But if those reasons aren't accurate for the cows which are placed in front of you, then they're absolutely useless because people want to hear why you've placed one cow above the other. So you've got to know how to describe the first place cow and tell people why she's better than the second place cow. So start with the most important reason for that placing. So if the cow in first has an absolutely fantastic udder, she's, high on, she's higher and wider in the rear udder, um, she has more suspensory ligament, then use those reasons as the reason why she's top of the class. Ah, sorry. Consider the most obvious points of superiority, but in a close placing, don't be scared to grant a lower place cow an obvious advantage. So the cow in first may have the best udder in the class, but the cow in second may have better legs and feet. Now, the udder has more weighting in a class than the legs and feet. But if the cow in second is better in the legs and feet, 
don't be afraid to say that you grant her the advantage in her legs and feet or granted that she has better locomotion than the cow in first. So always be positive and remember these are a breeder's cows. Like when you're at a show, um, a breeder has brought out his best cows to the show. He's put a lot of time and effort into taking those cows out of his system, clipping, presenting them. He, it's costing him money to do it and it's costing him his time and effort. Be respectful of that. Um, you know, you don't want to discourage the guy from bringing cows out at the show. Um, so be positive. Eat, try and find something positive to say about every, every animal if you can. Even if, it's, if you're judging a show and lucky enough to do it, even if you go down the line up and just say to the guy in last, sorry, I love the way that your cow has great width and power throughout, but it's a really tough class today or something like that. It's nice to go down the line and, and give reasons or say something to everybody. It, it puts you on the same level as them. It, it shows you that you, you want to talk to them. You've got an interest in their cows and you appreciate them being there in that class. So conclude the show or class with a complimentary and positive remark about the quality of the show, support of the exhibitors and perhaps the organization who have put on the judging competition or show. If applicable, thank your ringman, because trust me, not everyone is as polished as Murray Reisner. Okay, so now we're gonna go on some of the points of the cow that we were looking at. So this slide's all about dairy strength. So if we look at these two cows on the left, it's not gonna be pointing at the cows because you can't see what I'm pointing at, sorry. So if you look, I'm pointing them with my arrow. If you look at the two cows on the left, we've got two completely different types of cows. Admittedly, one's from a few years ago, but I didn't want to offend any breeder by pulling their cows apart. So if we were looking for reasons on why we're placing the cow on the left above or why the cow on the left is better than the cow on the right, we could say she's more feminine through the head and neck. She's more refined through the head. She has more style through the head and neck. She's longer and leaner through the neck. She has more dairy character through the front end. She has more dairiness or more angularity, or her neck blends nicer into her shoulder, or she's higher through the chine. Um, the quality of the second photograph isn't fantastic, but you can kind of see, and those are different ways of conveying your reasons on why the front end of the cow on the left is better than the front end of the cow on the right. So this next picture here, okay, this is the second cow of the competition. It's a cow from outside North America, so I'll, I'll give you that clue, but she's a really well-known cow in Europe. She's actually 11 years old in the picture, and in the picture she's produced over 100,000 kilos of milk. So if I, was, if I was to say anything about this cow or to urge you to sort of look at her, I'd ask you to note the angularity through the shoulders and how she blends smoothly into the crops. She has great depth and openness to her rib. Look at the strength of the top line for an aged cow, um, particularly at the strength of loin and width through her hips. Also look at the overall length of rump and correct thill position. I don't know what I was going to write there, but I obviously forgot to write something, so we won't dwell on that. So carrying on with the dairy strength and the body depth and capacity, we've got two very different cows here and we've also got the third cow in the judging competition. I can see quite a few, take, few of you taking photos with your phone, which is a good idea. So if we were looking at reasons on why the cow on the left, number three, is better than the cow on the right, we could say she's deeper in the heart. The heart is this point here. She's wider through the chest floor. So if we look at the spacing between the top of her front legs, we can see that she's wider through here than this cow on the right. She shows more depth and spring of ribs. So if you look at the middle point of her back to the very lowest point of her body depth, you can see that's extremely deep. It's one of the deepest cows I've ever seen. Um, but if you compare the two cows, you can see that she's got an obvious advantage in her depth and she's got more spring of rib. She's also longer right the way throughout. She shows more width and strength throughout. 
she has greater overall capacity and she shows more openness of rib. Now, as you can see, a lot of those reasons are very similar. They're, they're kind of describing the same things. It's just a different way of saying them. Um, one of you in the, in the roll call said that somebody went down giving reasons to each of you, but they gave the same reason to each of you. Um, now, as a judge, the worst thing or the last thing you want to be doing is saying the same thing to every competitor. Um, you could be saying the same thing to somebody who stands three places below. So you've got to be able to tailor your reasons and maybe, maybe say it a little bit different or concentrate on a different area. Or, or even though we can see the red cow is a lot deeper, um, we, could, we could try and say it different ways if, if that's applicable to cows through the line. So we could say, you know, the red cow is longer than this, this cow that's stood next to her. Or if, if it's a very similar thing in the placing below, you could say she shows more width and strength throughout. Or, or you've just got to find different reasons, even though sometimes you may be trying to say something that's very similar for different placings. But always be positive in your reasons, whatever you're saying. So Claire, we have a few questions before okay, you have that slide. Be back. Um, Ethan, do you want to go first? And then Emma, you'll be next. Go ahead, Ethan. Um, where did you see that cow number two, the second cow's from? Germany. Germany? Yeah. I'll give, I'll, I do, do I need to give you clues or shall I let you do your homework? What do you think, Jen? <laughs> well, that was a big clue. That was a helpful one. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But also, you may be interested in pop music. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> and uh, how about Emma? Do you have a question that's not looking for a clue on the on the contest? It's not re well. It's not about this. Sorry to bother you, but my iPad's at three percent and it's going to die soon. So sorry if it just. Oh no, out. worries, Emma. If you if you log off, you can watch it again later. Nice seeing you, Emma. Take care. Okay. Wait, I can watch until until it dies. Okay, if you want to, that's fine. Any other questions? Shall I move on, Jen? Yeah, I think you're good to move on. Okay. Oh, sorry, a question just came in. In the picture, the front legs are higher. In on the red cow, they yeah, it's you are you're not comparing them like for like in the sense that the cow stood on on blocks the red cow stood on the blocks ready for a professional picture but that's not really altering any of the parts that we've described like even if she was stood on all on the same level she's still going to be miles deeper in the rib and she's still going to be wider through the chest floor and she's still going to have more width and strength throughout the only thing that being on the blocks is doing to the red cow is it means it's making her run more uphill and it's perhaps changing the rump setting a little bit, which we can talk about in the rump illustration. Is that, is that what they meant? Yes, I think so. Okay, but her being stood on, on blocks for a professional photograph isn't really changing any of the major attributes or any, it doesn't have any effect on the reasons that we just spoke about. Okay. Okay, I'll move on. Okay, so we just briefly uh, touched on rump structure um, in the slide before. So if you look at the two cows on the left, particularly the arrowed lines, you can see which is the desirable rump, set, uh, rump structure and which is less than desirable, okay? So the top cow, if you look, basically the dotted line in both pictures um, shows the line from the hook to the, the pin. It shows where it, well, no, sorry, the dotted line shows the level line from the hook and where the pin should be. So if you look at the top picture, this is how a rump should be. If you look at the bottom picture, we can see that this cow is high pins. And we know that because if we draw a horizontal line from the hooks 
Now this is the hooks and this is the pin here. So these two points here should be level, but as you can see in the car in the bottom, her pin sits really up quite high. So if we look at the top picture, you see that it's more level. Okay, so those are two um, diff very different rumps. You can also have a rump completely the different way where it's really sloped, where you will see the pins be down here and that would be too much slope to the rump. But really we either have, there's three stages of rump, rump. You either have an ideal rump structure, you have a rump which is high in the pins, or you have a sloped rump. Um, now, as a two year old, you perhaps may see more slope to the rump, and this usually gets more level as they mature with age. But looking at these two pictures on the left, if we were to describe how the top cow is better than the cow below her, we could say she's more level from hook to pins, or we could say she's lower in the pins, or she has a more desirable rump angle, or another way of saying it is we could say she has a more correct slope to the rump, or, and then when we're looking at the tail head, we can say she's more refined over the tail head, or more desirable through the tail head. And what we mean through that is in this cow here, you can see the tail head actually disappears between the pins because the pins are really high. Whereas in this cow at the top, you can see she's got a really nice tail head structure. The tail sits nicely, sorry. The tail sits nicely between the pins and you can still see the tail protruding out. So, the cow on the right here, again, this is an aged cow. Note the width of rump on the cow above and how the tail sits correctly between a wide set of pin bones. So when we stand behind a cow, these are the pins here, and this is a cow with an extremely wide rump. She's got loads of width between her pins, which is what we're looking to see, okay? You can also see how the tail sits directly in the middle, covering the cow's vulva doesn't sit to one side or the other, it naturally falls directly straight vertical between the two pins. Okay, has anybody got any questions on rump structures? Like I say, the Holstein Canada has a great manual which describes these in a little bit more detail. I can see Clarissa's mouth moving, but I'm not sure whether she's talking to, uh, she's not talking to, <laughs> I can't see. <laughs> okay, any questions on rump structure? Okay, Jen, can I move on? Yes, keep going. Perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little about legs and feet here and knowing what to look for. Now, like I said about the manual for Holstein Canada, these photos, I couldn't find any better photos to use which described uh, legs and feet. So I've actually used what's in the manual. But if we look at, if we look at these three ABC cows, these basically show you a great visual on legs and feet in cows. So if we look at A, we can see she's really straight in the leg. Now, when a cow's straight in the leg, she doesn't flex through the hock. And she, you'll also quite often see them really puffy through the hock because there's extra pressure on the leg and they don't get that drainage working through the leg as well. So a cow that's straight in the legs is, is really equally as bad, if not worse, than a cow with too much set in the legs because they don't move as fluently or as freely. Um, so like in this diagram, I've just said she's too straight in the leg, not enough flex to the hock. Then I'm gonna look at cow C, which is the third cow. Now this cow, she's really coarse in the hock. She's weak in the pastern. So if you see the pastens here where I'm pointing, you see that her dew claws are a lot lower to the ground than those in A. So we'd say that she's weak in the pastens. Now this cow has too much set curvature to the leg. So if you look at her leg side on, it's kind of shaped a bit like a banana that's not desirable either now the cow in the middle i feel like goldilocks and the three bears here saying about the small medium and big but the cow in the middle is 
basically perfect leg set. She's got a really correct set of feet and legs. She's flat and clean bone through the hop. She's got more strength of paston than cow C. She pretty much has the ideal set of leg, okay? So in this picture on the right, we see the cow moving away from you. Bert's probably turning in his grave now here because I've used tracks again, but she tracks straight when viewed from behind. So what I mean when I say that is when you stand behind a cow and when you've looked right round the cow and you stand behind, you want to watch that animal or heifer walk away from you in any confirmation class. So the judge will tell you to move on and the leader will walk on. And if you, if you look at this cow, if you look at this cow here, I'm pointing at the screen again, I'm sorry, you can't see it. But if, you, if you're looking at this cow walking away, she's square, she's got a leg in every corner. When she moves her back leg, it's going directly behind where her front leg is. And that's what it, locomotion is all about. It's the way that she moves out on her legs and feet. You can see that this cow moves really freely on her rear legs. Um, she has great locomotion, moving with ease and fluidity. Um, or you could say she walks on a more correct set of feet and legs when faced with a cow that's placed below her that possibly isn't as good in that area. So has anybody got any questions on legs and feet? And does that explain what we're looking for? So we've got a question from Ashlyn. Okay, Ashlyn. Um, what, like, so you, you don't, like, you don't want the legs to be too straight and you don't want them to be, like, too bent? Like, is that what you're trying to say? Yep, basically. So if you look at A, B, and C, A is too straight. That's a no-no. She's not going to be able to walk. She's going to probably be in a cow in a large herd. She's probably going to do the splits and she's not going to last. Cows with straight legs are almost more problematic than cows who have got a little bit of set to the legs. Um, cow B is perfect. I love the legs and feet on this cow. I've watched her show many times before. She moves great on her legs and feet. And when you look at, when you look at the leg structure, it's not too straight and there's not too much set to it. Cow C, yeah, she's the one with the banana legs. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. So, so one thing to bear in mind, I'll just go tell you something for showmanship and maybe when you're picking your 4-H calves. How many of you, when you're showing calves, dread standing your calf up? That's probably one of the things which causes the most grief to 4-H members is when they have to set their calf up. One thing to remember when you're choosing your calves for 4-H is try and get one with good legs and feet because it's going to make your life so much easier. Like if you've got a if you've got a heifer who hocks in on the back leg. So if we if we look at can you all see the arrow on this where I'm pointing at on this cow? Brianne's nodding, so I presume you can. So you see how this cow stands really square. Sometimes you'll get a heifer before they carve when they haven't got the udder pushing their legs out who will hock in. So these hocks will be like this. I can't, I'm useless trying to put my arms together, but I, how, how can I show it? They'll go, the hocks, imagine the hocks on my wrist, the hocks will be like that and they'll hock in. Now, when you're trying to stand that animal up in, in showmanship classes and you know the judge is looking to see that you can stand that heifer up, it's gonna be a lot harder for you to stand that heifer up correctly because you're gonna be trying to get more whips through her back legs you're going to be trying to make sure that she stood correctly and if she's narrow on the chest as well the front legs are equally as important as the rear you're going to always be trying to get her to stand with width through the front end so when you're choosing your 4h calf legs and feet are really 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 important as as a judge i cannot stress how much easier it will make your life in showmanship if your heifer has as good a legs and feet as you can find. Anybody got any questions? Another question here for you, Claire. Can you explain what flat, clean boned means? Okay, so flat and clean bone. When you stand, when you stand behind a cow here, 
we're looking for this to be flat. We don't want puffy hocks. Like um, if you imagine, if you imagine, I'm trying to think of a good way of describing this. If you imagine an elephant's legs, they're wide. They're, they're, there's loads of like thickness to them right the way through. We're judging dairy cows and dairy heifers. We, we want to see the bone. We want to see the angularity in an animal. Flat, clean bone is when this area here is flat. We don't, you can't see it so much on cow C because it's a, we're looking at the side profile. But when you see this hock coming out like this and is puffy, that's not flat, clean bone. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, I think that's good. Thank okay. you. Okay, so like we saw on we saw on the cows that mammary system has a extremely high weighting in classification. When you're judging milk cows, it has an extremely high weighting as well. It's one of the most important things to look for in a class of cows and milk. A huge amount of emphasis is placed on the mammary system, both in the show ring and the classification process. Now, a question for you all, why do you think there is the mammary systems are so important? Can, between us all, can we think of three reasons why cows need good mammary systems? Brianne. Unmute yourself and come up with something. Oh. Picking on me, eh? Uh, what was it? Why do we think cows? Uh, so they can make lots of milk over their lifetime, and the uh, and the their udder will hang on, and so they'll. Uh, That's a perfect reason. That's a really good reason. We want we want cows who are going to last. But it costs a lot to rear a heifer to get them to milking age, so we want that cow to last as many lactations as possible. And having good udders is proven to help that. Like if they're well attached at the fore and rear and they're not too deep in the udder, it, there's a good chance they're going to last for more lactations than a, than a two-year-old who is really deep in the udder, has a bad suspensory ligament or has a bad fore and rear udder attachment. Somebody else, why else do you think that it's important to have a good udder? I think Elizabeth had her hand up. Okay, go ahead, Elizabeth. Hello. Maybe, uh, maybe Brianne stole Elizabeth's reason. Anybody else with an idea um, why cows need good memory systems? It's something to look at when you're in the barn. Perfect. That's a really good reason. Life's too short to milk ugly cows. Somebody once said that, and that's a great reason. If you're going to get up at four o'clock or five o'clock or whatever time you get up in the morning, you, the worst thing is being, can I, can, I shouldn't really swear, should I? Okay, so anyway, if a cow messes you on the parlor, you kind of forgive a cow who's a little bit better in the udder than one whose udder's on the floor and looks as ugly as anything. Like, like I say, you want to be milking, it makes milking process a whole lot more enjoyable if the cows have good udders. Anybody else? Okay. There's a few other reasons we could have. Also, management um, and health. Health and management are two key areas as well. Like, um, perhaps a cow's very open over T tens, or and she's going to be prone to mastitis, or. Perhaps she's, she's very unbalanced in the udder. Perhaps she doesn't milk out in one quarter. They're going to be a pain for milking. All sorts of reasons like that why we're looking for good udders. If, if we've got an animal and we see that she's light of a quarter, has she got a problem with, with her udder health? Does she, is she prone to mastitis? Um, has she been sick and lost some, some of the percentage in the udder? Like there's, there's a lot of reasons like that we can look at why udders are important and why it's important to be able to assess the udders. Has anybody else got any other reasons? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so 
the, mem the memory systems have many different things that we can look at and we'll start with forerunners. We've got a few examples of what's good and maybe what's not. So the forerunners illustrated on the left are both good examples of forerunner attachments um, compared to the ones on the right, which uh, pictures kindly uh, supplied by Holstein Canada classifiers, which are perhaps not such great examples of the breed. So when it comes to giving reasons and trying to think of ways to explain why one is better than the other, we can look at the cows on the left and say that they, they show more quality. So when we say they show more quality, um, another way of saying it is they possess more venation. Um, when looking at the four rudder attachments, we can say they blend more smoothly to the body wall or are more firmly attached or they are longer in the four rudder attachment if you look at this red cow, we can see when we're looking from this angle, you can see how it's nearly a straight line from the bottom of the udder right into the wall of the body of the animal. So we say that she's longer in the forerunner attachment. Um, if you compare them directly to the cows on the right, we, we can look and describe these cows on the right because we're not giving reasons on them. But this isn't what we're looking for in the breed. You, you can see how steep they are in the forerudder, how short they are in the forerudder. And you can see how the udder really cuts up before it meets the body wall. Those are all things that we do not want to see when we're judging cows. We want the udders to really blend well into the wall of the body of the animal. And, and we want them to look like they're giving milk. So when we see all veins on the udders like this, it's a good indicator that the cow it has a lot of dairy character and she's silky and you know that she's going to make milk and pay the bills and put milk in the tank so those are kind of things that we're looking for has anybody got any questions we've got a question from Marin. okay go ahead oh go ahead with your question Marin. Sorry, I don't have one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trust me, we're not born with the natural ability to give reasons. It's something that we really have to practice at. And that's one really good thing about this talk tonight is it gives you all the opportunity to ask questions and build your confidence. And I think your club and the whole 4-H organization is really to be commended on that because I haven't seen anything like this being done in the UK or in Europe like you are doing with 4-H. So give, your, give all of yourselves a big pat on the back for being part of it because it's a really great initiative. And um, also we've got cow on the bottom here, this cow's udder. This is probably renowned as one of the best uddered cows of all time. Um, so I'm asking you to identify her just by her udder. That's a bit of a tricky and a mean one to do. But if you were to ask breeders or people who maybe go to shows, what is what are their top three best uddered cows of all time? I'm pretty sure that this cow would be in those top three. So if you're not sure or you're stuck, grab your phones out, take a picture, and then ask somebody who maybe can help you. Okay? I'm not going to see that. I'm not going to know you've done that. So, and while folks are getting their pictures, um, oh, just sorry, a question. I don't have question a question coming in. Uh, somebody wondering why they make the udder shiny on those show cows. Okay, so that's a really good point. So, when we so this shine on the on the udders is done with like baby gel, um, baby gel and alcohol a lot of the time, and it just brings the whole udder to life, like. It makes them look more silky, makes them look um, more, ve more veiny. It just makes the udder look more alive, if that makes sense. Now, in some countries in Europe, you're not actually allowed to do that. They, they don't allow it. I love it. I think it, it looks really good in pictures and it shows a lot more quality to the udder. Um, Okay, so the red cow does actually look a bit pink because it's all set inside and there's a spotlight on her in this. Um, it wouldn't normally be that pink, but I just think it makes a, a big difference to the cows, to me. I love it. Any other questions? That's a really good question, though. 
like I say, don't be afraid to ask questions because there's no such thing as a stupid question. Okay, so I'm going to move on to talking about the symmetry of an udder. Is that, no, we're good? Okay, so in these top two pictures, we have two cows with great rear udders, but there is a difference. The symmetry of the cow's udder on the left compared with the cow on the right. As you can see, this cow on the right, if we look at this front left teat on this cow here, we can see it's hanging down quite a way. We can see that she's not level through the floor of the udder. And we can see by how far the fore udder is down here that this udder isn't symmetrical. Whereas the cow on the left here is perfectly symmetrical. So we could give this as a reason for placing these two cows. And we could say that a number of different ways. We could say she's more level, that we could say that the black cow here is more level through the floor of the udder or she has more balance and symmetry, symmetry to the udder. Um, and we could also say that she has a more desirable rear teat placement. If we look at the rear teats, they're both placed in the center of the, the rear quarters. Whereas if we look at this cow, the teats are sticking out a little bit far behind. And that's another good thing to look for. So even though they've both got great rear udders and they carry their milk high and wide, we could say, a pair of cows who both carry their milk extremely high and wide through their rear udders. But today I'm giving the advantage to the cow on the left for being more balanced and level through the floor of her udder and for having a fore udder which blends more smoothly into the body. And that would be a great reason or a great comparison on why you place those two cows like that. Now, if we look below, we've got some other faults which we don't want to see when we're either judging in a competition or in the show ring. Hopefully we're not gonna see cows like this in the show ring, but it's not impossible. So who's heard the terminology of reverse tilt and wondered what it is? There's, there's, a lot of, it's, there's a lot of people, they wonder whether a reverse tilt means she's higher at the back, or whether she's lower at the back. So a reverse tilt is when actually the rear rudder is higher up than the fore rudder. Now, this problem can sometimes get better with age. We can find that as they rip down, that it moves the shape of the fore rudder and they improve with age. So it's, it's not a fault we like to see, but it can change over a cow's lifetime. Now, this second cow here, <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, has a fore tilt, so we can see that her fore rudder is a lot higher than her rear rudder. Um, she kind of looks like a nanny goat, but obviously you don't really want to say that in your reasons. Um, now this picture shows a narrow rear rudder. If we look at the top of the rear rudder, you can see the width here is narrow. This cow here, when we talk about cows who are light in a quarter, perhaps they've had mastitis and they don't bag up level on the day of a show, we can see that she's unbalanced in the rear rudder. You see she's a lot fuller and you, we, this is the suspensory ligament down the middle here. Now they should be symmetrical both sides, but if we look at this cow here, we can see she's a lot wider and she carries her milk higher and wider in this one quarter when you compare it to the other. So we can say she's unbalanced in the rear rudder. This last cow here on the right, this black cow, when we look at the suspensory ligament, we can see that it's not very well defined. You want the suspensory ligament to really go into the rear rudder. We want it to be deep and almost look like the cleavage of somebody whose top's too low, if I can say that. But like, um, so we look at this black, <laughs> Brianna, I probably shouldn't have said that, you know me. <laughs> so we can look at this black cow here and say that she's lacking median suspensory ligament or some people would call it central ligament. So those are five other defects that we really don't wanna see when we're judging cows. And we can use those to, to find reasons for placing a cow further down the line.
Has anybody got any questions on the symmetry or other faults that they'd like to say, they'd like to know more about? Shall I move on, Jen? Oh, another, another fault which sometimes you'll see in a cow is a web teat. Um, now, a web teat is where the teat doesn't, how can I describe this, is where the teat doesn't go, imagine, imagine that's the teat of a cow. A web teat is where this bit goes out almost like an extra bit on the side of the teat, but we don't want to see that in cows. I probably should have got a picture of that. Okay, so no questions and I'll move on. Okay, so rear rudders. Now, I could have chosen better rear rudders than this to demonstrate, but I saw this um, two-year-old in Australia in January this year before all of COVID, and it's probably one of the best two-year-old udders I've ever seen on a brown Swiss. So that's why I've used it. As cows get older, you'll see higher, you'll see wider rear rudders for sure. Like, and we've seen pictures of wider rear rudders. But for me, and to show a brown Swiss, this is an incredible udder for a brown Swiss two-year-old. So when I look at this picture, um, note the height and width of rear rudder attachment of this brown Swiss, and bear in mind she's a two-year-old. So look at the strength and definition of the median suspensory ligament. So this is going right the way through the udder. And this ligament carries on and carries through to the front of the udder as well, the lateral suspensory ligament. So we're looking at the symmetry of the udder from front to rear. So you can see by the way her teats are placed that she's perfectly symmetrical in every way. She's, she's symmetrical in the rear quarters and also from front to rear. So look at the veination throughout her udder. You can see this udder is full of veins for a young two-year-old. Look at the teat size, the quality of them, the shape of them and the, the positioning of them. Look how they're placed directly in the center of each quarter. Like, like I said, I could have picked an older cow who's, who's wider in the rear udder, um, but it's nice to show other breeds too, especially when they've got so much potential as a two-year-old, as this, as this two-year-old has. Any questions on rear udders? Like if I just move back here, this is a great example of a rear rudder in, the, in an aged cow here. This cow in the top left corner. You can see the suspensory ligaments really deep. You can see how the teats are placed plumb under the center of each quarter. But I'll go back to the brown Swiss. Any questions, Jen? No? I think you're good to keep going. Perfect. Okay, so this is one of my favorite graphics as well. Some other things to look for in cows. <clears throat> now, if you look at this cow, you can see how she's got veins all up the wall of the animal. Whilst, whilst using the correct terminology is always encouraged, sometimes it's nice at a show to hear something people can associate with that's perhaps a little bit outside the box. So I asked Brian Benke, a well-known judge in the US this evening, how he'd describe this in the show ring. Um, Brian always comes up with some great sayings and he said, a true dairy machine, silky thin hide with veins over a body like a road map. And yeah, we can all relate to that. We see all of these veins over the side of a body. And okay, so it's maybe in Canada, you all have straight roads. I forgot that, but, it, but in England, trust me, the roads are like this. They, they curve all over the place and they go every direction. So, so that's why we say, you know, we can say that she's got veins over her body like a road map. Now, this second cow here, when we talk about openness of rib, this is probably one of the best graphics we can ever use to describe this. Um, this is a cow who's extremely open in the rib. Now, sometimes when you're examining a cow, you can go up to a cow and you can try this at home, but go up to a cow and see how many fingers you can fit between her ribs, between her last ribs. Usually it's three. On a, on a wide, on a cow with, who's really open in the rib, usually it's three fingers that you can put behind, between a cow. Now, in this cow in the middle, this, this gentleman that I know from Holland has got nearly his whole hand inside her ribs. 
Does anybody know who the cow is? This isn't this isn't for the competition, but I'm guessing maybe maybe somebody might know what cow it is. She was actually grand champion at Expo one year. It's Frosty. Okay, so this is how open she was in the rib. Okay, so oh, I keep doing that. I apologise. So then we have cow five for the competition. Some things you just can't describe. There's no correct terminology for some things which grab your attention in the show ring and style is one of them. When I'm judging a class, I'll stand in the middle of the ring and watch the cows come in. And probably, definitely in showmanship, well not definitely, there's the odd exception, but usually when you've watched all the cows walk in the ring, you have a pretty good idea of who is going to be winning that class from your first impression. It's not always the case, but there'll usually be a cow who'll walk in or a, or a showman and they will really grab your attention. This cow here, pictured, who is one of the competition cows, is one of those cows. She was a cow that never really gave you a bad look in the show ring. She loved it. She loved to be there. So when she walked in the ring, her ears were always forward. She never stopped, she moved fluidly all the way through. She was just the epitome of style. So style and showing presence, it's not a trait you can define, but some animals just have it and it's hard to ignore. Now, when you've got a cow that is as stylish as this, you can use that in your reasons. You, you, can, you can say that, don't be afraid to say it because if you've seen it, you can guarantee that she's grabbed the attention of people on the outside of the ring at all as well. So this to me is the epitome of style. So that's another cow that you have to name. Okay, so moving on and we're approaching the end now, but this is, this is beauty from every angle. So this is another cow that you have to name. Um, it's the same cow in every picture. And the backdrop to some of the pictures may give you a clue as to which country she's from. But this is a great example of how uh, the best cows look great from any angle. So if you need to take a picture, then this is the sixth cow for you to name to be able to win the jacket and the beanie hat. Okay, so in the handbook, there's some structural defects and discriminations which we really don't want to see in the show ring. Um, some are up, uh, so, okay, I've done this as a table, so it's, so as you can see whether they're a serious, a moderate, or a slight fault, or how we should discriminate against them. Um, but things like abnormal claws, so you, I've, I've occasionally seen an animal with only one claw come in the show ring. Um, you don't see it very often, but yes, you can discriminate against that. An advanced anus. Now, I have got some graphics on the next slide to show you some of, the, some of these defects as well. So if an animal's crampy as well, you'll sometimes see an animal come into the ring, usually in the older cows, where they, they stretch out or they shake when they're in the ring. That's when they're crampy, and that's a serious fault in a, in a cow, and it affects their mobility and locomotion, it's something that we do not want to see in the show ring. Um, the web teat, that's another thing, so we don't want to see those. Um, an undesirable head on a cow, we want the heads to be full of breed character, we want them to be, to have a combination of width and femininity. Um, you'll see some cows who are extremely short through the head or maybe have the wry face, those are things that we can discriminate against a high tail head or a recessed or an advanced tail head. Now, if I move on to the next slide, these are some of the faults that we see in tail heads, which are probably a good graphic. Like some people get very confused between what we call an, an advanced anus or a recessed tail head. So these graphics kind of show you the difference and it's important to know the difference between some of the associated faults. So, Okay, this is a serious fault. This is an advanced anus. Now, this causes all sorts of problems in the reproduction of cows because when they when they when they muck, the, the muck may not drain the muck may not drain properly and the, the vulvas may get infected. There's all sorts of problems associated with an advanced anus. So that's why it's considered a serious fault in the show ring. Now, this cow here it has got a high tail head. 
we can see that the actual tail head sits high above the pins, way too high, all of the tail head does. Um, now on the contrary, this cow here has a recessed tail head, which means that um, her tail head sits right below the pins. Um, now this may be that she, had, she was born like it, or it may be that she got injured during a heat cycle, but that's, that's a fault that we have to discriminate as well. And then this cow here has an advanced tail head, so you can see how the tail head is, is further back, but also advanced as well. Okay. So, um, sorry, anybody got any questions on anything that we're not looking for in the breed? So there is a question here. It says, uh, is, a higher, is a higher tail head not more of a breed characteristic of some breeds like milking shorthorns? Um, if I was to associate a higher tail head with some of the breeds, I'd possibly say that you see it more within the brown Swiss breed. Um, but what you have to remember is um, when you're judging cows, you'll usually have a preferred breed to judge, which will be the breed that you're most comfortable judging. But at the same time, you'll always get faced with like a supreme championships or what we call interbreed championships, where you'll be asked to to, breed, uh, to judge cows of different breeds. So it is a good idea to familiarize yourself with the, the true type models of each breed and recognize that some animals that maybe the same is not applicable for every breed and to bear that into consideration when you're judging it. But yeah, that's a really good point. You do see that more within the brown Swiss breed. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So just remember that, um, like I say, when you're giving reasons, just practice, practice, practice. Like you can never do enough. If you're really passionate about judging, then look at pictures of cows or look at videos of cows, listen to judges, give their reasons and, and try and get better yourself or, or never be afraid to ask one of your mentors or somebody you admire or your parents, if they if they have if they've judged cows before, ask them. But the only way that you learn and gain experience is by practice and by familiarising yourself with what we look for and what we don't look for. Um, so one last thing to remember is, no one said it would be easy. This is at one of the top shows in Switzerland, and this is the judge trying to decide between a close placing. And um, he's an experienced judge and, and this placing, you can see it really made him scratch his brain. So, so you're not alone. Everybody starts somewhere. Um, judging, judging is difficult. It's not easy. Not everybody's going to agree with you. But just remember that even if not everybody agrees with the way that you've placed the cows, if you can give your reasons on why you've done that and people can look at the cows and go, Actually, they've got a uh, got a good point there. That cow is better through um, through the rear rudder, or, or she is more correct through the feet and legs. Then you're going to gain a lot of respect for being able to do that, even if it's not the same order as a master judge. If you're competing in competition, you will get a lot of respect by being able to give accurate and comparative reasons on how you place that class. So my final slide. If anybody is missed some of the cows or anything, just shows you, oh, 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 just shows you all of the cows um, that you're asked to sort of identify. So that's a good opportunity to have a recap on it and um, and get your cows. So any other questions, or do you want me to maybe go through some of the questions which were asked in the roll call, Jen? Yeah, you can do that. And uh, members, if you have any questions, either just raise your hand or type them into the chat box. Okay, so Shelley and Shelby Eves from Frontenac, they said in the roll call that they've been told that their calf is not dairy enough. Um, I'm just wondering if some of the slides that we've shown tonight have helped them. Not dairy enough can mean a number of things. It can maybe mean that you're giving your calf too many groceries maybe being a bit generous with the, 
the, the feed and um, perhaps ease off on that. Or maybe it's just the fact that your calf isn't as dairy as, or as angular, particularly over the shoulders or, or through the thigh, as maybe some of the other calves it's competed against. Does that, I don't know if they're still online or if that helps them. Now, Taylor and Erica said they were placed down because their calves' ears were back. Now, I presume that's in showmanship. Um, I'm hoping it's nothing to do with a confirmation class. It's not really a valid reason in a showmanship class, but I know that when we're looking at showmanship and we're judging, uh, judging showmanship, that we do like to see um, animals in the class that look as if they want to be there, that maybe are alert. Like it makes your life a lot easier in showmanship if your calf is alert. Um, you know, if they walk around and they show an interest and are relaxed and walk around with their ears forward, or perhaps you can encourage them to get their ears forward. I know one thing I used to do when I was showing quite a bit was sometimes if you just sort of touch in the nostril or just maybe blow at them or, or something just to make them come alive a bit and just maybe they've gone a little bit sleepy, just maybe get the chain and just maybe wake them up a little bit. But um, it's not a valid reason to put you down in showmanship that your calf's ears are back. However, um, the judge will be drawn towards calves in a showmanship class, which are flowing with the, the leader. And perhaps maybe when they're showing more alertness, it does look more aesthetically pleasing. I hope that answers Taylor and Erica. Um, it also answers Joelle a bit, who said that they were placed down because their calf didn't want to be there and um, perhaps your calf was maybe <clears throat> maybe it put the brakes on a few times going around the class maybe it was wasn't interested maybe it just didn't look alert enough its head wasn't high enough those are all things which could possibly suggest to a judge that the calf's really not enjoying it and is giving the leader a hard time um, I'm just trying to think of some of the other reasons uh, Sarah said her calf wasn't square. Um, now we've sh shown a few graphics today with the cows um, on on showing that the legs were square, that they were placed on every quarter of that they were placed on every corner of the animal, if that makes sense. So when you stand behind them, you want the front feet to be wide and square. You want the rear legs to be wide and square. Um, you, it's easier to see in a milking animal, like the picture. I'm trying to think, let me just go back. So, okay, this is a great picture here on the right of an animal, an animal who, who stands square. You can see that she's very symmetrical in the way that she stands, like she's got width between her chest and width between her rear hocks and, and she's what we call square. Um, so hopefully that helps them. And the same applies to in junior judging as well. We've got a question from Elizabeth. Okay, fire ahead, Elizabeth. Hello. Um, so once I was at the Royal, it was a few years ago, and I, it was in a showmanship class, and my reason, the judge said that the reason was because my calves pins were too high. And that didn't make sense to anyone. And we kept trying to figure out why he said that and it didn't make sense. Was it, a, was it a male or a female who said it to you? It was a male. Phew, thank goodness. Okay, moving on. Right, okay, so yeah, that's not, that's not really, you can't really use that as a valid reason in showmanship. But having said that, what possibly the judge meant was he was maybe looking for you to correct the fault through your heifer's rump. But he should have said that in a different way to you. Like, if you've got a heifer that's, how did he say it, high in the tail? Yeah, high in the pins. High in the pins, so okay. So if you've got an animal high in the pins, you want to keep the back legs positioned under the heifer, which will try and keep the pins down as low as possible. Also, one thing that you can do to try and help that is, you behind the shoulder of an behind the shoulder of your heifer. Ah, if we look at this picture six as a as a as a way um, and watch for my arrow, if when you're if when you're showing, you sometimes just pull the skin here. It sometimes makes them just pull themselves up through the crops, 
which can give the illusion of, the, of being stronger through this area and lower in this area. So that's something to bear in mind. But yeah, I'm not criticizing a judge, but in a showmanship class, oh, I've got a thumbs up. But in a showmanship class, telling, telling a showman that their calf's too high in the pins isn't really a valid reason. What I would have preferred them to say or what they possibly should have said was, um, I would have liked to have seen you correct your, your rump in your heifer a little bit more by, by trying to keep the pins lower or something like that. Okay, perfect. Any more questions? Uh, Abby's got her hand up, so over to you, Abby. I was wondering if, so you know how you said to get her feet underneath her to make it look like her pins are lower? Is there such thing as putting her feet too far underneath her? Okay, so the whole, my, when I'm, when I'm looking at showmanship judging and when I'm looking for the best showman, I'm looking for a person who I'm confident could lead an animal for me and get the most out of that animal. So to do that, any show person has to be able to instantly look at an animal they're leading. So even if you get asked to switch halters, to switch straps and lead another animal, as you're walking towards that animal, you've got to look at that animal and look where her problems are, look to see where she has the faults. So if, if you see that an animal is high in the pins and you're switching to move that, and you're moving on to the halter of that animal, I would want to see you try and get the best out of that animal. Now, if that means keeping her legs maybe a little bit under her, I, I judge confirmation as well. So I'm going to look at the animal and say, yes, okay, this girl recognizes that her, the heifer she is showing has prob is a problem in the pins and she's trying to camouflage that as much as possible. So if I see you doing that, I'm going to give you the benefit because I know that you see the fault in your animal and you're trying to correct that. Does that help? Perfect. A few more questions coming in, Claire. Um, you just mentioned switching halters. So somebody's wondering if that's something they still do for showmanship um, in other countries. Okay, yes it is. Um, especially in like the older classes, I would never do it in the junior class. I would try not to do it at all if possible, because I think one of the most important things about showmanship classes is the fact that you've worked with your heifer and you know your heifer and you have put the time and effort in to get the most out of your heifer. Having said that, if I've got three or four people at the top of a class who are experienced enough and it's a really close placing and I'm really splitting hairs in that class, in a showmanship class, I might possibly ask them to switch heifers to see if they get anything extra out of the heifer than the original show person. Also to see if maybe they recognize the faults in an animal instantly when they're walking to that heifer and how they deal under the pressure of being put in that position and see if they can quickly recognize the faults and show that heifer um, to try and mask or try and improve those faults. But I would only do it in a really, really tough class as a last resort. Okay. A few more questions coming in here. What's your favorite thing about judging and what's your least favorite thing about judging? Okay, my favorite thing about judging is it combines two things I really love. I love traveling. I love going to shows and seeing that the cows they have, um, it's something I've always loved. I've always been, I've always loved great cows and that's what I was brought up with. So I, I admire people who take the time out to showcase their cows to me. And I love seeing cows, whatever country I'm in. And also it's a lot about the people, like whatever country I go to, no matter what language they speak, you can have a conversation about cows. Even if it's with sign language, you can always have a conversation about cows. And the whole show industry, the whole people involved in showing, 
I just I just find it fantastic. Like you've got so much in common with them. They've got so many interesting stories to tell, and I love meeting people. And you've probably gathered I love talking, and I just get a real buzz out of talking to people and seeing great cows. And oh, there was another point to the question: What's the worst thing about judging? Oh, oh, the worst thing about judging is maybe when you have a cow with a big reputation who's done a lot of winning before and you perhaps they don't look as well as they've looked another day and you have to judge any class of cows on that day. You can't think, oh my God, this cow looked amazing six weeks ago at such and such a show. You have to judge that animal on the day as she comes out in the ring in front of you now, sometimes that's not going to please or be what the owner wants. And you know how well they can look, but perhaps they don't look their best on that day. And sometimes that can be hard, having to face that position. But like I said, you've got to judge them on the day, which cow is best, and then which cow is second best. That's the only way you can do it. You've got to completely distance yourself from who's on the halter, from whose cow it is, or what the cow has achieved in the show ring before. Great answer. Uh, a few more questions coming in for you here. So uh, one of our leaders is commenting that they often see sloppy posture on members. So they're wondering if you have any tips on how to correct sloppy posture in, um, when showing. And um, also, if you can just comment on what some of your overall things you look for that draw your attention to uh, a member in a showmanship class. Okay, so on showmanship competitions, I'm sure Steph covered this pretty well, like I worked with Steph and I know she's done one of the seminars already on showmanship, but I, I cannot stress that first impressions really, really are so, so important in showmanship. Um, like I know when I judged in 2018, in every final, I was pretty confident of who was going to be stood top of the class, even by the time they'd walked halfway around the ring. They, they just had it. And that's a very hard quality to describe. Like, obviously, they still had to set the car up and do all the little things right and maintain composure throughout the class. But how you come into the ring and how you hold yourself and how you position yourself is so so important and how you position yourself in comparison to the calf so in showmanship you are you when you're in a showmanship class you're portraying the whole cattle industry to a huge presence you like at the winter fair there's hundreds thousands of people watching either around the ringside or they'll see the magazines or they'll be watching it online or seeing the coverage online so there really is a global audience and you're, you're portraying milk. Like, like even though you're showing calves, a lot of the general public won't make that association that these animals don't give milk. So when you step in the show ring with a, with a calf or a cow, you are representing your industry. So look as if you wanna be there, look smart and be tidy, like be clean, show yourself in a good mannerism. So like, I want to see, so for your uniform for showmanship, clean white trousers, I want you to have shirts tucked in, I want you to have belts matching your boot, I want clean boots, um, I want your hair tidy. I know this is a tricky one because some of, the, some of the lads like to have longer hair, but just make sure you're tidy when you go in the ring. It, it really does make a big difference. Like, you want your animal to look as best as possible, but also you've got to look as good as possible so and that 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 also applies to when you're judging like I would hate to see any judge walk into a ring without the proper attire on and not looking professional and um, the lady who asked the question asked how can people stand and how can you not slouch well when you're when you're stood with your calf I want you stood up straight I'll put your shoulders back stand as if you want to be there and like give yourself the correct distance between um, between the calf and the side of the ring and also between the calf and yourself. Um, another great tip and how I teach a lot of the peewees to sort of lead um, over with us is 
when you're walking your animal, you want to flow with your animal. So you want to be in time and take the same steps as them. So somebody in the roll call said how they were accused of being robotic, which I can understand. But also with peewee kids, another way that I try and teach them to move in time with the animal is imagine that when they're walking backwards with the heifer, is to imagine that they have and this possibly might teach them to be robotic, but it's a good way to teach them to get in time with their animal, is I tell them to imagine that they're walking with a piece of wood between their left foot and the animal's right foot, the front right foot. So when you take a step back, your heifer's, sorry, when the heifer moves forward, you're moving your corresponding leg back at the same time. And you do this with every step. So that just, the difference it makes when you're in time with your animal, whether you're walking backwards or whether you're walking to the side, is just massive. Any other questions? Another completely different um, vein here, but how did you get into photography at shows? Um, that's a really good question, and I kind of fell into it by accident. So I was really great friends with the girls at Cowsmo. And they, Cosmo, obviously you'll all know is, was primarily to start with a Canadian magazine and then, and then sort of progressed into the US as well. And then they branched out further afield, you know, over the world. And in Europe, flights from North America to Europe are very, very expensive. I was located in Europe and, and like, you can get really, really cheap flights from the UK to anywhere in Europe, like probably for, you could go anywhere in Europe for $150 return flight, so it's not expensive. Um, but so, and I was really good friends with them and I'd helped them in at shows in Canada. And I kind of just started, I bought myself a cheap camera and I started doing some of the shows in Europe. And then basically that's just grown to a point now where I have three cameras, multiple lenses and a bag full of very valuable equipment and I love doing it. It gives you, if you're not judging, the best view you can have of a class is behind a camera because the camera never lies. Does that help? Excellent, that's a great answer. Any other questions? So last chance for questions for Claire. You know, it's, it's quite late at her home. I think maybe Claire, you've got all the questions. So That's good. We're, we're going to, um, uh, we'll give you a chance to say some closing words and then um, Eth, well, as I said that, we have one more question coming in. So, uh, do you find that there is a huge difference between shows in Canada versus in Europe? Um, some countries, like if I was to rate, if I was to rate my favorite shows in the world, I would for qual for for the top of the lineup and for quality, World Dairy Expo and the Royal Winter Fair would be right up there. Then I would go for Swiss Expo in Switzerland, and then probably the European championships um and then maybe cremona in italy and idw there is a, there, there is a lot of difference but it's more the differences are more to do with the the type of feeds that they have like in switzerland's very similar to north america in the type of bodies that you see in the show ring because they feed they are fantastic hay so you see those those deep ribbed capacious cows um, which have developed because they, they receive hay all the time. Um, Australia's another great country for the, the IDW in January, um, but they are different types of cows. You, because the cows have to withstand and be able to withstand 40 degree heat quite often, you, you see a different kind of cow maybe, um, and they're outside a lot more. So you see cows with really good legs and feet, but maybe uh, a larger type of cow and more capacious type of cow because they're getting that movement all the time to allow them to develop. So, but then in some part, in some parts of Europe, the cows are primarily fed on, on like 
complete ration on what we call TMR, a total mix ration. So it's much harder to get the, the depth and the capacity in the body when they're fed like very short fiber food. So yes, there are different, the shows do differ, but the top cows in countries like Switzerland um, would definitely compete in North America. That's, that's the best way of describing it. And two more questions have come in for you. Ethan is wondering uh, what your favorite dairy breed is. And Addison is wondering if you have an all-time favorite cow. Oh, that, Addison, that is a great question. And when I'm traveling with people, if I'm not asking them what their favorite films are or what their favorite music for a championship song is, I always ask them what their favorite cow of all time is. Um, and for me, I'm going to say two cows. One is a cow that none of you, because you're all way too young, will have ever heard of, probably. And it was one of the first cows that I ever saw, and she was way ahead of her time. And that was a cow called Tarali Astro Sherry, um, which probably a lot of you have never heard of, and you probably will never see a picture of, but it was just a cow. I was very young at the time, and she just made a lasting impression on me. Probably my favorite cow of recent times would be the cow which I think most resembles the true type model, which would be Through Lane James Rose. Okay, did I miss one question out there? What was... And your favorite breed? Oh, my favorite breed. That's probably quite an easy one for me because I was raised on a Holstein farm. Um, I primarily showed Holsteins and so if I don't say Holsteins, my brother is probably going to kill me, but close second would be Jerseys, and I have actually owned a few Jerseys now. Excellent. Okay. Good answers. And I, I am lucky to um, live next door to the breeder of um, Tara Lee Astra Sherry. So okay. that's there you go. fun fact. <laughs> So I think that's all. Oh, we have one last question here. And this one, uh, many of our speakers have been asked. So it's a little bit of a favorite question of ours. Um, what are your favorite current bulls? Oh, wow. My favorite current bulls. You should never ask somebody who sells for an AI company what their favorite bulls are. Um, I think I'm going to change that question a little bit because I don't want to single out our own bulls over other people's bulls. But if I was to say the bull, which is some of the bulls which have had the most influence on the breed, I would probably say Pixton Shottle all over the world and maybe Braydale Goldwyn. I think bulls which I really admire are Livy Dempsey. Um, trying to think who else now. There's probably going to be loads which I haven't thought about. See, I could go right back to bulls like Starbuck and things like that and Matador or Ru uh, see a bull I'd love to see in a pedigree is Startmore Rudolph, but they, these are all Holstein bulls, but they're bulls that, you know, maybe I, I like to see in a pedigree or I think done a great job in herds or a bull I like to see in the show ring. So yeah, there's loads of different answers I could give to that. I can't single it out to one bull, I'm afraid. All right, that's a fair, fair and um, honest answer. So thank you. So I think that's all our questions, Claire. I'm going to turn it over to Ethan, who's got a few words for you. Okay. Um, on behalf of all 4-H members, I would like to thank Claire for talking, for taking time to talk to our large group and helping us learn. It was really neat to have someone from the UK join us and share out, share your knowledge. Um, this um, challenge should also be fun too, so thank you. Thanks, Ethan. I've really enjoyed talking to you all and I've been amazed at how many questions you've come up with. So just everybody, have a go at judging, practice your reasons, um, you know, look, or like if you want more, if you want more manual or if you want more information, like I say, Holstein Canada have a great manual that gives you loads of great information. Um, or I think this presentation is going to be available through Holstein Ontario too. So, and don't forget to enter the competition. 
So good luck, everybody. Thanks for joining me this evening. And I hope to see you all in Canada soon. I hope the Winter Fair takes place and I can see lots of you. And if you do see, if the, if you, if the Winter Fair does take place, then make sure you come and introduce yourself and say hi, okay? But thank you all for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much, Claire, and for staying up so late to talk to our group. No problem. It's been a pleasure. We'll Thank let you, you go now, and we do have a few other things just for our club to finish up. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Bye.